to Wednesday night service at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Let's take our handles and turn to 15. We'll sing Lead Me to Calvary. 15. Father, we sure love you and we thank you for today. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the light in the times of darkness. I thank you that you have a light on our path. And you have a hand on our shoulder and you're guiding us and you're directing us and you never leave us. Lord, I, I thank you for this day and I thank you for the mercy and the grace that you've shown and all that you're doing in our lives. I pray God you just bless us tonight. I pray that you bless all that goes on downstairs and all with the teens. And Father, you know that we're running under a pretty heavy burden. This is a uh, tough time. That's all there is to it. But Lord, you said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. And I love this psalm. Uh, now, Lord, lead us to Calvary. Help us to remember all that you've done for us and help us to stand true to you. And I pray God you'd help us to do right by our children in all things now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, let's turn over to 100. Day by day, 100. <laughs> Yeah. 
attitude and all that stuff and get there and just be it's a hot dog we made it praise the lord you know the there's a lot of songs i like the uh, uh there are people sing these songs and and uh sometimes they the message isn't right and it's not necessarily scriptural uh one of them is uh, uh praise god i made it and uh, the truth is if you know christ your savior you're going to make it Amen. but sometimes it does seem like a battle just to get there and to keep it keep going straight and everything well i'm glad to see you thank you for being here tonight a couple things to remind us all of this week is uh, we're not having a music camp uh, it got rained out the, everything's flooded that's great that's wonderful and then we have other things that are going to come in its place uh, if you have not get, gotten the the text uh, the funeral for david will be saturday uh visitations from three to five and the the funeral will be at five o'clock and it's at the Typical new memorial gardens on the west side. They have a uh, um, what do they call that? Uh, it's not a mausoleum. It's it's a uh, new building they put up so we can have the services, the chapel, I guess, like thing. And uh, that's what what's going to happen. So the the funeral itself will be at five o'clock. Visitation from three to five. Uh, Burl and I will both be uh, preaching, and uh, it's not going to be real long. You know, we won't make it like a two-hour service or anything like that. Uh, but I want you to really be praying for this. This is, uh, we've had a lot of funerals. We've done a lot of things that um, had heartaches and heartbreaks and, and great and wonderful things. But this is different than anything we've gone through. And this is far harder than anything we've, as a pastor and preacher that I've ever faced before. And it's different. I guess it's, it's just so completely different. But please keep praying for Angie and the family and hold them in, their, in your prayers. Now, as far as feeding the family afterwards, we're not going to do that, but they do have a place where we can we can bring, like, finger foods and snacks, and I'd like you to help us with that to, to provide that for over there at the uh, chapel. And I'll get with Miss Jen and talk to her, and she'll get the, uh, the word out and everything, but we want to be able to supply them with water and, and uh, I don't know, drinks of some kind and, and uh, food because people will be coming in and going and stuff. And it's... Uh, uh, just going to be a little bit challenging. We don't want to, when, when Ben died, uh, my brother works for Kroger Company, and uh, when we got home from the funeral, the folks from Kroger had been there, and they brought in these giant boxes full of deep-fried chicken. We ate chicken for weeks and weeks and weeks. Do you remember that, Hef? Do you remember all those? <laughs> yeah. It just We had more chicken. Uh, you could shake a stick at. We probably just put uh, Colonel Sanders about out of business over there, probably. But anyhow, uh, we don't want to overload them on stuff like that. But we do want to be uh, considerate, help them, and, and she appreciates so very much everything everybody's been saying, everybody's been offering to help, and and she says this is a way that you can help, and that'd be a great blessing. And so please, uh, please show up for the funeral and services and all that stuff, and then uh, pray for the kids. Uh, the kids need to be there. This is, we live in an extremely perverse generation. And for somehow, in some ways, uh, some of these kids are almost romanticizing death and things like this. And uh, this is, I don't know if you pay attention to the news or whatever, but uh, sometimes when there's one suicide, then there'll be a cluster of them right in that same school or right in that same group or whatever. We don't want that. And it's because uh, the thing is, it's, it's glorified, the death is glorified or, or the whole thing is romanticized. And there's, there's a chance stuff like that could happen with us. And we're doing our best to stay ahead of things and, and talk to the kids and, and help them any way we can and, and try to talk with the parents and keep everybody involved. And, stuff but the kids need to be here for closure here's the thing uh we live in this they live in this fantasy fantasy world where they they play uh whatever that uh, call of duty or whatever and they're killing people and blowing things up they're, they're fight they have all these videos and they're killing people left and right and and but buddy i tell you what when you go to the funeral home and you see one of your friends laying there and he's not getting up anymore that changes you that brings it home and that, that brings closure. Uh, had a, I've had one of these one of our kids from the school. He's asked me three different times, "Is David coming back?" No, he's not coming back. And uh, so I need you to be praying 
that God will speak and work and that these kids will show up so they can get some help, they can get some closure, and the parents will be there too. Yes, sir? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I get it. Yes. You know, it, it was bad enough when we had cable TV. Now it's gone way, way beyond that. So, yeah, shut that, all that stuff off and unplug. And, and, uh, but but just, let's just really be praying that God will work in this thing. This is as much spiritual, spiritual warfare in our face as we've seen in a long, long, long time. And so... It ain't over yet, folks, but I need you to be praying. And then on uh, on Friday, November 5th, Central Indiana Youth Rally, kids will be going and for that and, and just be praying that they'll have a good time and everything will go well. We, we have to strive to get back to a, uh, a semblance of normal. Uh, the, we'll have a new normal. Things are always going to be different now, just like any time something like this happens. But let's just be praying that God gets us back and gets us square and, and uh, he blesses us that things are better after than they were before. And say, so how can that ever be? By God's grace, by God's mercy. Angie is as strong a woman as I've ever met in my life. And she's facing things and she's staring it right down the, the right eyeball and dealing with it. You just keep praying for her and asking God to continue to strengthen her and encourage her and bless the kids and, and bless the, the kids in school. And our teachers definitely need your, uh, need your prayer because they're dealing with it daily and we're watching the kids for for challenges and things and things have come up we've got <laughs> i can't tell you things are going on all the things going on but I'm, I'm telling you what things happen and we've got a tremendous staff they're doing a great job in dealing with with these with the kids and helping them i've called uh, some of my friends and and asking uh, a lot of different questions on uh, different things concerning the the mentality of all this and i'm talking about the uh folks that are um I'm going to use this term because it's the only one I can think of in, in the psychology end of things, but on, but not just from a Christian psychology part, but I, but I mean from a um, even from a criminal side. Because there's a whole lot of things that that they say that the, you know there's these these signs that you should see. Well, you don't see them until it's over, until it's too late. And there's there's all sorts of different uh, don't know what the right word would be. Um, hmm. Uh, just, there's, there's a lot of a lot of issues with kids that we don't know everything, and we're not. We didn't write the book on the mentality, and nobody has yet except God, and we don't see everything as soon as we should. But we're doing our best to get ahead of everything, so that this ain't going to happen again. That's our prayer, and that's our hope, and that's our our drive. So uh, we want to help these kids. This is from beginning to end a spiritual issue. It is a spiritual war. We are at war. And the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual darkness in high places. And some of these kids are in very dark places in their lives. And they need mommy and daddy to realize that and help them. And they need the teachers to be able to help them. And we're doing our best to get that done. So there you go. That's message number one for today. Brother Roxy, why don't you come and let's sing some more. Let's stand in front of 96. God leads us along.
love. The second verse all together. States that had his his parents had, had died and then his brother suddenly died and they had very very large farm lots of lots of things to take care of so he's had to come home and get that all uh, fixed up 347 lots sold and you know if you've ever been to auction you know each thing they sell is a lot or whatever it's called a lot but that's a lot of things several vehicles trailers pieces of farm equipment powered parachute and hundreds of pieces of machinery and machine tools sold. And uh, it, was a, it was a whopper of a sale. But anyhow, he's had to take care of that. And there's a whole bunch of other things to take care of. And they're get, working still to get back where they need to be on the, the field. So just read this and you'll be, uh, you'll be blessed. Now, we've got the missionaries that uh, the Lord is really using in a great way. They have uh, great strength and power and persistence in what they're doing. And I'm just tickled with the stories. Just be, keep them in prayer. Also, okay, now then, uh, of course, uh, bereavement, let's keep the Brown family uh, in our prayers and all that's going on. And the school is uh, grieving also. Uh, this, is, this is pretty tough, pretty tough. But I'll tell you what, the best thing for the kids to do is get back in, get back in place, and get, get going and, and deal with it. We can't allow kids to hide from their, their fears, their challenges, and everything. This is a tough week, and I think you pray, be praying for the kids. God bless each one of them and help us in all that we're trying to do and uh, trying to help them. And then uh, music camp is rescheduled for next year right now, so that's, that's wonderful. I appreciate uh, uh, Burl be, being willing to shift gears and switch things around and, and uh, just deal with this. And, and it's very, very, uh, very good. He has put his heart and soul into this thing. It worked and worked and worked and worked. And he's been working on it for over a year uh, with, with the, you know, getting everything organized and doing the logistics, getting everything together. And then yesterday he went in and started just taking everything down and getting packed and getting it done and getting it put out of the way and being done with it. And uh, for next year. So just be praying that next year will be bigger and better than ever. Seems like we've never had one before. So anyhow, uh, just be praying about that. Then uh, this Tuesday, Brian goes in for surgery. Uh, for replacing the piece of skull that he has missing. And so it's, uh, he, he wanted to go in and uh, just zip him open and throw it in there and be able to come home right away. That's not the way it works. And uh, so it's gonna take a little bit of time. He's gonna be in there a minimum, what did they say, a minimum of three or four days, three or four days possibly a few weeks. And it all depends on how everything works. Just be praying for him and he's doing good and he's working, uh, trying to get things, get his energy back and everything, but we want him to go well. So that's this Tuesday at 10.30 when he goes in. Uh, okay, and let's see, it seemed like there was something else I need to remind you of. But anyhow, that's all I got for right now. I'll think of from it. But anybody else got something you want to add to this tonight? Yes, ma'am? Makes me sick, and that's about it. So, but uh, my primary doctor doesn't want 
nest for them because I have to go in next month, the 22nd, to see the cardiologist. So. Okay, so you need to get a doctor. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know where I was going to tell you. Uh, the children's home they're down there at the Stillwater School, they are leaving tomorrow on their long trip. They won't be back until uh, right before Thanksgiving. They're going to be in church after church after church for the next few weeks, so just remember them. And uh, Lord bless them, take care of them. God, there's a lot of good things going on down there. It's, it's really exciting. So anyhow, just keep praying for them. All right, somebody else? Yes, sir, ma'am? And there's one south. Okay. All right. We're praying for you. Somebody else. It's Daphne. Selena's having surgery too. Oh, is that right? Selena's having surgery too. Okay. I knew that. What time is your surgery? 10 30. Can't be everywhere at once. We'll be praying for you. Um, how long is this going to take? Do they know? <laughs> oh, man. Amen. All right. I'll just be nice. I won't say nothing more. We'll be praying for Selena Bobina. Okay, somebody else. Yes, ma'am. It's Mary. It's unspoken. Mary Kelly, an unspoke. All right, we're working to get the baptistry warmed up so we can baptize you, okay? Trying to get that squirt away. Trying to get that heated up. Right. Somebody else. Yes, ma'am. The chores have no heat. We've got heat. We're showing our propane and we're having a hard time to get someone out to fill it. Oh, okay. Well, they found out the tank's too close to the house, so they're not going to fill it, so i got to get a new tank set. The tollers have no heat. <laughs> <laughs> we got we I'm not gonna say anything more, just <laughs> Sounds like you're heated up. <laughs> he, says, he says, don't turn the thirst out on him like okay. We ran the furnace last night, it's fine. <laughs> I wasn't home last night, I worked. <laughs> Kayla and I were working. <laughs> when we came in, we I got a hundred gallon tank that you can borrow and hook up. <laughs> Strength and wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Strength and patience. And patience. Yeah. Oh, no, God will give you patience. Yeah. Strength he, to be patient. He is, he is giving you patience. That's what this is about, obviously. He says, are you sure we were supposed to move into this house? It's kind are of you sure? Too late for that. I went, uh. I was venting. Yeah. Was, <laughs> It seems to me that the company that uh, filled it before would still be filling it. Yeah, I haven't found them yet, so <laughs> if I find them, we'll be good. I see. <laughs> uh, praise, praise the Lord. Amen. Mary Hart, we have good luck in medicine. That's why we're laughing. Yeah. Making us feel better. Yeah, because he didn't like it when I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, somebody else. Roxy. We need some wisdom and patience. <laughs> we got it going on, so we don't laugh, Becky. <laughs> yeah, she's not going to laugh. <laughs> so you sold your house and you're moving where? <laughs> sold your house. On the west side? Yeah. Put the mountain rents and sold yeah. it there. In an apartment in the west. Yeah, it's a nice one. You nice one. Look at it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you had buyers for your house. For my house? Uh -huh. No, I'm not selling my house now. With the 12 kids? Uh, oh, that yeah. Test. I forgot about that. Yeah, I read that test. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get Caitlin and, and uh, Winky Dink to I buy like it. I like that plan. <laughs> What's his name? <laughs> Jeff. Oh, no, I kind of like Jared. Jared. Poor <laughs> guy. Do you, Winky Dink, take <laughs> I got to work on his name. I pray for him all the time, but I just, it's one of those names that just doesn't come easy to me. I, so they want 12 children, so I thought that'd be a perfect house for them. But getting him to move over here is kind of a challenge. Because she, at her job, she makes more than enough to buy the house, I'm sure. Amen. 
So you just borrowed the other Barbie house. Yeah. Oh, no, she's not going to be working with you. Uh, no. Yes, sir. If they start working Stillwater's um, children's home or so, they can start off really quickly. <laughs> well, that's a thought, yeah. yeah. And then talk about ever having kids real quick. Amen. <laughs> All right, somebody else. Ashley. Schultz, and Ashley has two on spokes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Ma'am. Okay, it's your your sister or her husband? Your sister. What's her name? Melissa. Not well. Okay. All in, all done. Okay, we're on just a little late. Let me go ahead and pray and we'll, we'll go on to the service. Now, Father in heaven, we sure thank you for today. I thank you, God, that you, you know the end from the beginning. You, nothing surprises you. Uh, nothing takes you by storm. Lord, you're, you're ahead of everything, and you're always there, and you are always ready. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us the strength and the power for the day. And, Lord, I pray that you would please bless all these requests that we have, all the challenges that are going on, all the great things you're doing in our lives. We thank you for them, all the hard things that you're doing. We thank you for promising to be with us and see us through these things. And some things, Lord, that you bring that just come to pass, and some things that come to adjust our lives and adjust our hearts and minds and, and change us from the inside out. And Lord, we ask that you'd be merciful to us and help us. We are a frail people, and we're a finite people. And Lord God, we do not know what you know. All we can do is trust you and walk by faith, and we have to keep our eyes open, our spiritual ears open and we have to be tuned to your heart and to your mind and I plead with you for power and for help and for blessing upon our whole church, all of our, our church family. I pray for all the students there in the school that you'd work in their lives in a mighty way and help them and guide them, help their parents as they're dealing with the issues at home. And Lord, I, I, I uh, do pray that we would be very, very vigilant in our homes, knowing what our kids are watching, knowing what they're doing, that we would we would uh, be diligent to know the state of our flock that you have given to us. Lord, I pray you'd help us in that and help us not to be afraid to unplug things and help us not to be afraid to replace things. Anytime we take something away, we have to replace it with something positive. And uh, I pray that you'd help us to be wise in how we do that and, and to do that. Uh, there's no reason we have to be just like the rest of the world. Uh, we, we're supposed to come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us and give us power in these things. And I do pray that you'd, you'd bless the tollers that not having heat. I think it'd be wonderful now, Lord, that if you'd just let the, the weather warm up and stay warm for the next couple of months. But if you don't want to do that, then maybe you could help them find the, the, uh, the right propane company. I just pray that you'd bless them. I, and Lord, there's always challenges, and I pray that you'd work in their lives and help them. I pray for Miss Suzanne, and she's got these heart issues, and I pray, Father, that you'd help her get the right doctors and the right people on the job and, and help them to take care of this, please. And, Father, I, again, I pray for Angie and, and Temperance and Ariana. Lord, I pray, God, you'd bless them. I pray for Wayne, God, uh, that you'd have mercy on this whole family. What a disaster. Lord, God, I, I cannot remember ever seeing anybody that's walked into such mess in such a short si uh, time, amount of time. Battles within and without and so many troubles and challenges going on, and she's got to have great wisdom. I pray that you'd please bless her and help her and give her strength. And mercy, oh God, work in her life and help her in a mighty way. Lord, I do pray for uh, uh, the lenders. I sure thank you for them, Lord. I, they are such a blessing to our church. They do so many things for different people. And they don't sound a horn or flashlights or anything when they're, they're helping folks, but they help so many people. And I pray that you bless them as they go south. I pray that you let them have a wonderful time. And, and I know part of it is, is saying goodbye and, and uh, probably not getting to see the rest of the family, parts of the family again until to get to glory. And I just pray, Lord, you give them grace and strength and power and protection and meet their needs and help them. I do pray, Father, for uh, Brian as he goes in Tuesday for this surgery. 
to uh, repair this from, from this uh, tumor that he's had. I pray that you'd bless with that and let everything go well. And I asked for Selena. Lord, she's, she'd been to the doctor, had so many surgeries here in the last couple of years. It's just it's time for this thing to get done. I just pray that you'd bless in a mighty way. You'd help her and bless her as only you can. Let everything go well. There'd be no problems or hiccups in this. And that you just bless in a great way. I do pray for the uh, boarding school down there for Stillwater's Lord. I pray that you bless them as they're traveling. I'll be traveling out this, this week real soon. And thank you for all the great things you've been doing down there. And you continue to work in those boys' lives. And thank you for the letter I got from Dion down there this, this week. What a blessing that was. Lord, I pray that you'd work in his life. And I pray that you'd help him and encourage him and use him for your glory and honor. Bless each one of those young men. Bless the Millers, Lord, and all that they're doing. I pray for Miss Desney that you'd bless her and help her. And I pray, God, you'd keep them safe, keep a hedge about them. And I plead the blood of Christ upon that ministry that you, you would just bless it and let it grow and prosper for your glory and honor. Lord, I do ask for all these unspokens. I think of Ashley and Miss Mary Kelly and for Lily. Lord, all these things that they have and all these others on here for Rebecca and for Sean Frakes and for, for, for Katie and Roxy and Burl and Darlene and Joy and the Spoon Moors and Maria and Mike McGrew. God, I pray that you'd bless them. And uh, Lord, sometimes we find out what these unspokens were and it, it uh, is stunning what people are praying for and what they're they're needing help with and it's lord is so much i pray god you just please bless i do ask for roxy and and family lord you give them great wisdom open up doors and help them and bless them in a mighty way i pray for melissa uh mrs pringer's sister lord i pray that you'd bless and i pray that you'd, you'd give her strength and health and i pray you'd help the doctors figure out what's wrong or else lord just make her feel better lord i pray that you'd work in a mighty way and father for this service tonight i pray that you'd bless and help us and and help me say just exactly the right things in the right way. And I do ask, Father, for all the, the uh, things going on around here tonight, that you would have the preeminence, that Christ would be glorified, and that we would stand in the right position, stand in the right way, and that, that you would bless us and help us, Lord. I pray, God, you'd speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okie doke. Now then, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 27. Interesting verse. Proverbs chapter 27. We have this one verse. Actually, this is tied to the next verse, but I don't have enough time to preach both of them, so we're just going to preach verse number 20, 21. Proverbs 27, 21. As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is man to his praise. As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. In uh, Proverbs 27, 2, the Bible says, Let another man praise thee, not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. It goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 8, says, By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. We get praised for being good folks. We get praised for being bad folks. Uh, we have evil reports come up about us, and we have good reports come up about us. Uh, we're told, we're, people are telling us what, that we are deceivers. And yet we're standing for the truth and doing right. and We're doing the best we can. People say ugly things and boy, it hurts us and breaks our heart. But God says, the finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold, and so is a man to his praise. Now to, uh, to paraphrase this without doing any damage to the scriptures, uh, one way or another, uh, it, it would be something like this. The crucible, now how many of you know what a crucible is? Let's stop and ask a question. A crucible. What is a crucible? Okay, it's, it, but it is a what itself? A pot. There you go. It's a pot, but it's a uh, can stand high temperatures. The crucible for silver. You put the silver in there. You put it in the fire, and the silver melts, and the the pot doesn't. The crucible for silver. The furnace for gold, and a man for his praise. So we're talking about refining silver. We're talking about refining gold, and we're talking about refining a man refining a woman. What God does is He finds ways to help us and change us. Um, this, we find the meaning for this as the uh, processes of metallurgy test the precious metals so a man's true character is, uh, is tested uh, by his public reputation and proves either what he is, he's really worth or what he's really not worth. Proverbs uh, twelve eight says, "...a man shall be commended according to his wisdom." But he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. So here's the crucible. It brings all the impurities. Once they, they put the silver in there, and they, and they, or they put the gold into the furnace, they put the, both of them into the fire, 
and the fire melts them, and we just don't melt them and say, okay, we're done. It melts and melts and melts, and what it does is brings the impurities to the top, and the impurities are called what? Dross. It's a D word, dross, exactly. And uh, the, the, uh, the man is not, the woman is not put into the, the furnace but of fire, but we're put into a, a furnace that's like fire. It's the furnace of public opinion. Public opinion drags up all the bad in a person, and he who stands this test is generally esteemed. I cannot for the life of me imagine why somebody would really want to run for a public office, uh, to run for, a, for the mayor or for the sheriff, for instance, or for any public office, a dog catcher even. Uh, buddy, they're, they're going to do an exam on you. They're going to bring up, they're going to go back and talk to your kindergarten teacher and find out whether you picked your nose and ate it or not. They're, and they're going to bring everything that you've ever done, everything that you've ever thought, every stupid thing that you've ever said, they're going to bring it up and they're going to rake you over the coals. Why? That's what people do. It's just mud raking now in our politicians' lives. Public opinion drags up all that's bad in a person. Uh, certainly this praise is a stimulus to hard, hard work. Let's say you, you are running for a public office or you are in a position where you're, you're uh, out in front of people. Say maybe you are a public speaker or maybe you're a teacher or you're maybe something else out there in the public view and, and people are saying kind and good things about you and maybe you go somewhere and they, they have a surprise party for you and somebody stands up and says, uh, this, is, this is Joe Blow, and I want to tell you a few things about Joe. And they go on, and they, just, they say this and this and this and this that's so positive, so good, so wonderful about you. And you're, you're blushing, and you're about to melt right through the floor because you don't want to hear this stuff. But as you hear what people actually think about you, it causes you to uh, uh, stimulate yourself to harder work to make sure that this stuff is true. It's an incentive to try to make your, your self-worth, your self-worthy of the, the estimation other people has given to you. We are at all times three different people. We are who we think we are. We're who other people think we are. And then we are who we really are. Now, the best thing we can ever do is to get who we think we are and who we really are to come together and match, so that you know who you are, you know what you are, you know where you stand, and you've drawn some lines in the sand, say, I will not cross these things, and I will not, I will not allow those things on the other side to come into my life. I won't allow them to be a part of me. When I stand and say, uh, yes, my yes is true, and my no is true, I won't budge on them. I will be honest and honorable and decent. And when I get to that point, and when I, I know on the outside that my, the, the, the personality and the person and everything that I am on the outside that people see matches what I know of myself, then I'm doing pretty good. A lot of times people can't tell really whether you're doing pretty good because uh, for whatever reason they don't recognize it or, or whatever. But sometimes people have a better opinion of, of us than what we deserve. But what God does is He said, I have found a way to purify you and to help you. And what we will do is allow you to be praised. You say, well, I've never been praised for anything. Oh, yeah, you have. People say things to you all the time, and how you respond to it and how you think about yourself is that crucible that we're put into to bring up all the, the, the junk in our life and to get it out. Uh, public opinion is, is uh, very often false and is always very unsafe standard of moral excellence. I'll give you three reasons. Uh, the, they call it the bandwagon effect. And the bandwagon effect is not taken into, into consideration or into account when we're, we're judging individuals or judging things. We're all individuals with our own free will with the ability to make conscious decisions about life. Is that right? Yeah, it's right. Do we always make our own conscious decisions about right and wrong? No, we don't. What happens? Studies have shown that human beings uh, tend to want to agree with one another so that they don't stick out like a sore thumb. And so somebody will stand up and say something, and the numerous people will agree with them because they, they don't want to, to be that one person, the odd man out. And the, the study, uh, the people who are doing a, some of these studies, one time they did a big study on this type of thing. They got several people involved, and they got some actors to come in, and they, they got a group of people together, started asking questions, and they had some uh, actors in there that uh, already knew what was going on and they answered wrong 
to the answer. They give the wrong answers on purpose because their, their challenge was to influence the rest of the group. So as they would influence, they would, they would answer the question and they would study to see how many people would stand up and say, mm, no, I don't agree with that. No, that's not right. And the, the actor could, he could do, what do you mean that's not right? Who are you anyhow to think that I'm, you calling me a liar? And just to see if they could get the other guy to back down. It doesn't take a whole lot to get people to back down. It doesn't get a whole, uh, take a whole lot to get people just to, to uh, follow in line. For instance, we have a friend that we have uh, uh, maybe a lot of confidence in, and he's gone over to the Tapanyaki restaurant, which is closed down now, but it's the old Chinese restaurant. I don't forget what it's called now. And he goes in there, and for whatever reason, he doesn't like the place. And so he comes back, in and he says, you know, that, that, that restaurant over there, the Tepanyaki or whatever it's called, I went there, I didn't like it. It was dirty, the food was cold, it was nasty, the people were rude. And so most people would say, oh, well, I'm not going to go there. I had people tell me that. And I drove by it several times, and I looked at it, and I thought, looks like a buffet to me. And so I went in there, and it became my favorite place to eat. I mean, they had, they had a sweet and sour chicken. They had a uh, hot and sour soup. They had uh, all kinds of weird things that I won't eat. They had crawdads. I don't know if people eat crawdads or not or why they would, but uh, I don't generally eat bait. But they had those in there, and people seemed to like them. And you name it, they had it in there. And, there was, and then they had the, uh, the uh, thing where you pick up all your veg vegetables, put some meat on there, and si season it up, and they cook it for you. And I really like that. That's really good because, man, I, I have a big time with that. And so whoever was telling me this isn't, they didn't like it, whatever reason they had for it, that was wrong. But you have to be willing to admit that sometimes we just take somebody else's opinion and we say, okay, I heard the tapenyaki is no good. I heard it's bad. I heard they serve bad food. It's dirty. The people are rude and it's overpriced and everything else. And so one person Telling folks, here's what they found. One person standing up and saying something will influence 10 people. And those 10 people will go out and influence other people. And so one person can very easily influence 100 folks about a certain thing. But then there's that one guy who stands up and says, nah, I'm not buying into that, I'm going to go check it out. And that's, that's what they, they found out. That, and that's called the bandwagon effect. Most people just want to be on the bandwagon. Then number two, public opinions... Uh, and public opinion polls do not take into account implications. Uh, they, have you ever, you ever answered the phone and they said, hello, this is so-and-so uh, from George Barna Polling, and we want to ask you some questions. They have never called me. And, I, you know, I would like to be able to say, I'm not interested and hang up on them but, or something, but they've never called me, but sometimes you get called and they talk to you and they ask you to ask, answer some questions. In a, uh, the famous Brexit uh, vote in the UK a few years ago, Brexit, when the, uh, Britain was deciding to get out of the ex exit from the European uh, uh, Union, there was a big debate on it. And everybody, uh, they were pulling all these people and talking to them, and they asked them, do you want to leave the EU? Or do you want to stay in the EU, European Union? And that was the only question they asked them. And, uh, well, the world knows the answer. The, uh, the Brits voted 52% to get out. But, however, after weeks following the vote and they pulled out, uh, people started uh, saying, man, maybe I, I made a mistake here. I, I might not have thought this thing through. I didn't know it was going to be this kind of a problem. I didn't understand all these things are going to happen. I didn't understand the consequences of it. Of course not. You weren't asked the right questions. And so a lot of times, uh, public opinion polls will, will form the question, they'll shape the, the question uh, so that they'll get the answers that they want or what they're looking for. It's just part of the way people do business today. And then the third thing is, people just don't tell the truth. That's why opinion, public opinion is not really to be taken into effect too much. People don't tell the truth. I can prove it real easy. 2016, there's a big election going on in the United States of America and had a whole bunch of people running. They want all on to be the president, but it all came down that Hillary Clinton was, she is the shoe-in. She is going to blow everybody out of the water. She is going to be the next president of the United States of America. They've, they've done the polls, and people say, yeah, yeah, I'm voting for Hillary. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Donald Trump comes in, and he blows everybody out of the water, and they're standing back and saying, how did this happen? They finally decided, well, the people we polled did not tell the truth. Nope, they sure didn't. Uh, that's why he won. 
people lied about voting for Trump. So now then, one of the things we're, we need to learn from this is public opinion doesn't mean a whole lot. I was taught in school, if people are, are, are talking about you, that's great, even if they're talking bad about you, because at least they're talking about you, they're talking about your church, and you're getting advertisement. Whether it's good, uh, good uh, advertisement, bad advertisement, they're talking about your church. I prefer people just leave me alone, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll hang a Bible on their door and a, a letter, and that's how they can talk about me and come and, and visit or whatever, but I don't want people picking on me, but the truth is they do. And so I learned this also, uh, whatever people say, don't worry about it. Uh, Carlisle Scott was an evangelist down in Crawfordsville, out of, out of Crawfordsville, Montgomery County, for 70-some years. He was a great, great guy, great preacher, and I wish to goodness that he was alive and preaching today. He was, he was just a tremendous guy. But anyhow, uh, another preacher down there in Crawfordsville uh, called him up and said, Scotty, and he's, they're, they're the same generation, basically, and he said, Scotty, he said, uh, uh, people are saying bad things about me. They're just, they're really running me down, and and just saying a lot of bad things about me. And Scott, he just, he had a way of going right to the truth. He'd, he'd just reduce everything to its most common denominator, and he'd deal with that aspect of it. And he, he says, uh, well, Brother Baker says, is it true? And he says, well, no, it's not true. And he said, then don't worry about it. Just keep your head up and go on. If it is true, put your head down, pray and ask God to forgive you. Put your head up and just go on. Don't worry about it. And that's really what we have to do. That's our choices. Uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can get under the, the load of this thing and, and let it weigh us down and beat us up and all this other stuff. Or we can just say, no, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm going to go on with life. And if I've done wrong, I'm going to uh, confess and forsake it and go on. Public opinions don't take into uh, account so many different things. And so what we really need to do is not worry about them. Uh, just go on. Christians must realize that the action of the fire that God's going to place us in, this crucible He's going to place us in, uh, is so that we can be tested by the mouth of them that praise us. That's a bad thing. We're going to be tested by other people. They're going to be the fire. The folks out there, the people that you work with, the people that know you, uh, the people that, that know your character and watch you, they are going to be the fire that tests you and brings up in you the dross or the impurities, so that God can help you get them out of your life. Public opinion will not reveal it to you, but I guarantee you uh, it's going to make things hot for you. There's no surer test of a man's true character uh, than his behavior under praise is examined by the masses of society. Many men are spoiled by it. So if somebody comes up and they start really praising you left and right, you're, you know, you're getting all this, this super popular Praise. It's like these guys that are football players or baseball players or basketball, any kind of sports dudes, and they're, they're being bragged on. They feel like they're gods of some kind. They feel like they're some kind of deity and they can do no wrong. Uh, these these uh, football players in the NFL, uh, the, boy, they can, they can run fast, they can tackle hard, they can throw the ball, they can do everything, and they're great, great, great people. But you get them off the ball field, and the NFL, instead of standing for the National Football League, all of a sudden stands for the National Felon League. These guys are a bunch of, bunch of uh, crooks, they're robbers, they're thieves, they're murderers, they're everything you want to, want to call them because they have no real character. But they've been praised so much, uh, they, they think they can get away and do with anything. If a man comes out of this uh, crucible of praise uh, without injury, not, uh, and he's not rendered vain, he's not become uh, blind to his, his own defects or uh, disdainful of others, looking down his nose on everybody else because they're not nearly as great as he is, uh, his disposition is good. He might actually going to be able to make it in life. First Peter chapter 4 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Job said, But he knoweth, he's talking about God, he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God is going to put us all in the fire. He's going to test us all. And he's going to try and get down there. Those things that we don't want to deal with, that we know are wrong in our character, in our life, the sins that we are, uh, we're trying to keep hidden from everybody else, those things have got to be dealt with. And God's going to put us in the fire to deal with it. So a man is proved by the mouth of him that praises him. Now, I learned a long time ago, if people say good things about you, that's great, that's fine, thank God, uh, God is good. If they say bad things about you, uh, you're, you're probably right, I need to take that under advisement and think about it. But if it's, you know, something good, God gets the glory. If something bad, I need to check it out. And that's just the way I roll. And that's the way everybody ought to roll. Public praise is a bad thing. 
Uh, public praise tortures the just, but it, it elates the wicked. While it, but it, it tortures the just, it also purifies him. He puts him in that, that fire. And then he starts to look at his life and said, man, they're saying things like, about me that I, nobody can live up to. Uh, Beth, or uh, not Beth, Nellie and I were, are listening to this book. Uh, it's about uh, uh, different people in history. And they're talking about Kit Carson. And man, Kit Carson, he had, he had some kind of career. He was some kind of uh, trailblazer and everything else. And the, the Fremont, when he and Fremont were blazing the trail across the country, he, he would write store, he'd write reports back that go back to Washington and somehow then they would get been printed in the press and everything else. And these stories about uh, their exploits and all the things they did, they'd get picked up by authors and the authors of dime novels would take Kit Carson and they blew him up into something he never was any kind of. And they had him, great big strapping mighty man. He was just a little guy, and he had he's bow legged, and he's freckle faced, and just a little guy, and he's just wiry and mean and able to handle himself, take care of things. And he's back east one time, and, and people heard that Kit Carson was in town, and this guy came looking for him, and then he found him. He says, "You're Kit Carson." He said, "Yes, sir, I'm Kit Carson." And he didn't have a whole lot to say, and that really irritated him too. And he said, "Yes, sir, I'm Kit Carson." He said, "You are." He said, "Yep, I'm him." He says, well, you're not the Kit Carson I'm looking for. But he was looking for this, this giant that had been, been, been presented to him through the books and stuff, and it's just a bunch of uh, foolishness. But that's what the world does to us. They try to blow us up and make something out of us, if they can make money off of us especially. And it tortures our soul because that's not who we are. We know who we are. But to the vain man, oh, man, he eats that stuff up. The vain woman says, yes, that's who I am. I am great, I am glorious, I'm, I'm wonderful. The Bible says in Acts chapter 12, Upon a set day Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them, unto the people, unto the Jews. And the people gave a shout, saying, It's the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. Why? Because praise and honor goes to God. And if we are so vain and we're so puffed up with pride that we want all this adulation and stuff, we're in competition in our heart with Almighty God. And we got a problem. We need to clean that out. That's why pride is such a terrible, terrible thing. The truth is revealed in a person. Does the things that are say about this person make him seek for the glory of God or for the glory of himself. We have to be careful. So how do we cleanse and protect ourselves from collecting this dross, the, these contaminants of the world? How do, we, how do we protect our heart from this? Well, if you take your Bible, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll look at a few verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter, 10, or chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. The Bible says, We then... And First Corinthians, or second, first and Second Corinthians is written to the church. It's written to individuals in the church and to Christians. This is not a message to the pastor. It's not a message to uh, other apostles. This is to Christians. This is to folks like you and me. He says, "We then, as workers together with Him, with Christ, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For He saith, I have heard thee in an accepted time, in the day of salvation I have succored thee." Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. What's that mean? That means that we as Christians have to be careful that we are not offensive to other people out there because they will look at you and say, yeah, that's what that church is like. I don't want anything to do with it. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonment, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, 
by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many riches, having nothing and yet possessing all things. All these things, why do we, why do, we do these? In all things approving ourselves. As ministers said, preacher, I'm not a minister. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. You minister the truth to people that you come up to. You minister the Word of God to them. You minister the love of God to them. You minister all these things. Oh, so many things in here. Uh, uh, in patience. The furnace don't work. My house is cold. The gas tank is the wrong place. You've got to do it. In patience. In afflictions. In necessities. In distresses. In stripes. What is that? Well, that's when they take and whip you unjustly. We haven't had that done for us yet. In imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. When was the last time you, you prayed and fasted for somebody or something? How long has that been? By pureness. You know, sometimes it's hard to be pure in mind and heart. In this old world, it really is. In pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering. Sometimes you just you got to put up with stuff for weeks and weeks and months and months with people before it finally breaks through on them. By kindness, God wants us to be kind when we really want to be ugly. You say, "Well, my husband doesn't do right by me, and I'm tired of me. I've come to my. He stepped on my last nerve. Pray and ask God to give you a couple more nerves. Let him step on those too. In kindness." By the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand, on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown, yet well known, as dying. And behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many riches, having nothing, yet possessing all things. God says this is the way that we get this dross out of us and keep it out. This is the way when the praise comes, when the, when the adulation comes, when people try to blow your, your, your heart up and your pride up, this is, oh, you are so, tell them at some moment, oh, you're so pretty, you're, so, you're always the most beautiful thing in the whole wide world. Well, I tell my wife that all the time, but somebody else tells her I'm going to be really irritated with them, unless it's one of the daughters or something. Uh, if, and somebody comes up to me and tells me, oh, Brother Murdoch, you're so handsome. I just tell them, yeah, I know it. It's just the way it is. Some of us got us. Some of us don't. I talked to this kid yesterday or uh, last week. I was in the uh, gas station, and man, he's from some other country. I think he's from uh, Haiti or somewhere. And does he ever have a just a big head of hair? And he's got got uh, braids and dreadlocks and stuff. And they're going all different direction. And I, I'm looking at him, and I, I say, "You want to know something that's not fair?" I said, "All oh, you young guys, you've got all the hair." And he looked at me, and that, that, that deep voice of that brogue, he says, yeah, man, but you used to have hair, too. <laughs> he says, you were young. I said, I was, I was, that's a fact. He said, I said, I still wish I had some of it. He said, maybe when I'm old, I'll not have hair. And so, I, you know, maybe you won't. I hope you don't there. <laughs> but people say things to us, and it gets down, and it works on our pride. I can tell when I'm backslidden. Because I want a Corvette. What's wrong with Corvettes? When I was a kid, that was the epitome of a cool sports car. I had a friend that, uh, my dad ran a garage, and, and this friend of mine asked me, he said, can you change the brakes on my Corvette? I said, oh, yeah, I can change the brakes on your Corvette. It's a 63 split window coupe. It was nice. And I brought it in and pulled it, got it up, changed the brakes on it. I thought, well, i got to go test these out. That was the longest test drive I've ever taken in somebody's car that I worked on. But man, was that nice. And, and from that point on, I always wanted a Corvette. But the Corvette deals with my pride issues. And so as my pride issues in life come up, I always use that, that as a, a barometric measurement. As, as pride's coming up in my life, I'm always looking toward Corvettes and wanting them. Have you seen the new Corvettes? I mean, if you don't want one of those, it's because you're too old to drive or something. There's something wrong with you. Man, those things are beautiful. But what we have to do is be careful and don't let any of these things get a hold of us. 
because it affects our pride and the pride is what ruins us and that's what brings this, this uh, being put into the crucible and letting God work on us. Now then, as the finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is man to his praise. Uh, let's, let's move to more specific things here. Uh, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure. What treasure? This, this treasure of God, this, this godness, this, this hope within us, uh, the, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. We have this within us. And God wants us to remember always, it's not you. It's not you. It's me working through you. It's not your beauty. It's not your power. It's not your strength or your wisdom. It's me working through you. Paul said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. It doesn't matter who you think you are, what education you have, or where you've been to school, or whatever. If you do not have the power of God on your life, you're missing something. This is something that God has given to us. He's put this treasure within us in this earthen vessel of ours, and He wants everybody to know this is God working in this, this veil of flesh here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick, it means alive, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We have to have the word of God working in our life because it helps us to get down to the deep things of our life to be able to deal with that stuff that's on the inside that we need to get out. By the armor of righteousness. Righteousness is a powerful, powerful weapon. I got saved in 1972, and I came in uh, contact with a missionary lady from Crawfordsville, Indiana. Her name was Kay Lamb, and she was uh, a missionary to Chad, Africa. The government of Chad had changed all the, uh, had changed all the natives under this, this new regime or whatever were required uh, to go back to their native gods and the, the, uh, and the, the witch doctors and all that stuff, all that kind of stuff, and the... Uh, People who had Christians who had been uh, converted to Christianity, those natives were being forced to renounce their God, their Christian God, or they were going to be killed. And they were killed. They they martyred lots and lots and lots of people. And I won't tell you how. It's just it's horrible. Well, Kay was over there, and other missionaries were over there, and they had to get out. And they uh, were getting out and getting ready to leave. And some of them were leaving just ahead of uh, uh, being persecuted and uh, killed. And some of them got out, some of them didn't. Kay was, had packed all her clothes, was getting everything into the uh, Jeep, getting ready to go. And she went for one last look around the, the place, the hut or the house or whatever it is she's in. And a native stood there at the window and had a bow and pulled the arrow back and was going to shoot her right through the heart. And all of a sudden, this lady who'd gone over there, a uh, single lady, gone over there to serve and to work with other missionaries and to teach the children, act as a, as a, as a nurse and a teacher and a, and a Sunday school teacher and everything else and help these people. Uh, she'd lived her life right and done everything right. All of a sudden, this guy with the, the, the bow and arrow pulled back started screaming and he was terrified and he was saying, something has a hold of me and I cannot move. And he was literally frozen in place. He couldn't release his fingers to release the bow. She turned, ran, jumped in the, in the, the Jeep, and hot-footed it to the airport and made it back to the, the States. Why did that happen? Mm, the armor of righteousness was protecting her. She had done right, living right, being right. Here's something else about her, Kay Lamb. Her daddy, Russ Lamb, used to be a uh, mechanic up in the Chicago area for Bugsy Moran. I don't know if you know who Bugsy Moran is. You need to go back and study your old-time gangsters. But then he moved down to Crawfordsville, and uh, Kay was riding the, the church bus to, to Sunday school, and she got saved, and she was excited about it. She came home, and uh, Daddy's under a car working on it. And she looked down and said, Daddy, won't you go to church with me? And he says, No, honey, I'm busy. I, I have to go to church. And she said, Daddy, are you saved? Are you going to go to heaven when you die? And his little girl saying that pierced his heart through. And it wasn't long before he started coming to church and Russ Lamb got saved and Russ Lamb got converted. And Russell Lamb, the guy who ran with the gangsters, became a deacon in the church where I got saved. And I had to sit before him and give my testimony before they'd approve me for salvation. I kind of liked the fact that I had an old gangster buddy mechanic on that whatever that is, board of, of uh, reckoning there to what, let me get baptized. She got her dad to get saved and she went to Africa got people, getting people saved and God used the righteousness 
His righteousness to protect her. The Bible says on the right hand and on the left, that is both by offensive and defensive weapons. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty unto the pulling down of strongholds. In Ephesians chapter 6, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of, devil, of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me tell you something. The, uh, the uh, rulers of darkness in this world have declared war on you and on your home and on your children. And they want your children to die and go to hell. And we have to be wise on this. This is just not, you know, this is, they're just watching fairy tales on, on uh, TV. Or they're just, these little, these games that they're playing, that's just, it's just silliness. This is fun. Uh, you know, it's no big deal. I got news for you. You can be blind to it if you want, but there's a deeper thing going on. And just like Brother Mullendorf said, one of the best things we can do is unplug. But if you do unplug, you have to replace it with something good, pure, and powerful and positive. Because nature hates a vacuum. Just go down and take all your kids' electronics away. So, okay, there you are. Now then, what are you going to do? Well, they'll find something to do, and it won't be good. But they will replace it. We had, had a kid we took in, and, and he was a skateboard freak and everything else. Man, he was on the streets all the time riding a skateboard. And I told him, you're not going to ride that here. You can't have it here. I said, we're going to have to change that. What would you like to do? And he decided he'd like to learn to play a mandolin. So we got him a mandolin, and this kid who spent all day on the streets skateboarding started spending eight hours a day on his mandolin. And he became a very, very good mandolin player in a short amount of time. And he got around some of these guys been playing for 40 years, and they couldn't believe how good this kid could play in just a couple years, better than these, these old-timers could play. Why? Because there was a vacuum, and he filled it with something that was positive rather than something that was extremely negative. By the armor of righteousness. Righteousness is a powerful, powerful weapon on the right hand and on the left uh, by prayer and supplication. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. The armor of righteousness, there's always been something soldierly about uh, the writings of Paul and the way that Paul lived and the things that he did. Uh, his uh, life course, his, his uh, resolution, his courage, his fortitude, his capacity to, to uh, endure, his fidelity to his spiritual commander, to the Lord Jesus Christ, never wavering, always going forward. Uh, these are all high military qualities, and Paul was the original Marine. He wrote the, the uh, he was the, the poster boy for Semper Fi, always faithful. And the soldierly mentality of Paul no doubt played into the reasons God chose him for, the, for an apostle. You have to understand the Word of God was finished before the world ever began. And when the, the, the Bible was written, God chose men with the right personality to write certain books because they were, they were for this for this thing. God says this about uh, Jeremiah, before, I, um, uh, before you were born, I've, when I, before you were formed in the womb, I knew thee. He says that before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Same thing with every one of us. God, has, he knows us. He said, well then, Burl, or, or Burl, duh. Uh, he said, Brother, Brother Murdoch, do you do you think that we have free will? Can, can we decide what we're going to do? I mean, God calls us something. Can you choose? Yeah, I could have said no to preaching. You could have said no to anything. You could have said no to, to salvation. But God looks at, looked at Jeremiah. He looked at Paul. And he knew that these men were going to say yes because he sees the end from the beginning. He knows what you're going to say. But you have a free choice. And you have a free will. And God chose Paul to write so much of the New Testament because he, his personality met what God has already written down. God had uh, created him so that he would match the personality of those things that would be right. This doesn't negate free will at all. This is just how God works. The Christian's career, and much more emphatically, the apostolic career, appears to be one large military campaign. We are at war. If we're not at war, we need to be training for war. And if we're not training for war, uh, we better be thinking about it because we're going to be back in it pretty soon. We are in, we are, we're not called to recess. We're called to the battlefield. The Christian's necessity of spiritual armor, our foes are many, they're active, they're vigilant, they're formidable, and they're untiring. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you. 
He wants to devour your children. He wants to devour your mate. He wants to devour those people that you love, your school, your church, everybody here, your teachers. The Bible says that we're to stand fast in the faith. The warfare to which uh, we're called is accordingly called perilous and serious. 2 Timothy chapter 3, For this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, unable to control themselves. <laughs> I was watching this um, video from the police department, or from the jail actually, and the, uh, they had a guy who was, he, he just, he was a wild man. He said, I can't control myself. Well, he went wild one time and they shot him with a taser. You know what? He was under control. And he was good. And he was, he's laying there on the floor shaking and shivering. He says, man, I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'll be good. I promise I'll be good. <laughs> I bet you will. You don't want to ride that lightning anymore. But they're, uh, they're, they're just... <sighs> Incontinent. They're fierce and they're despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. That's where we're living today. That's what life is today. That's what all these riots and everything have been today in our lifetime. It's that we are living in perilous times. We need the blessing and the power of God. Uh, we need the natural resources uh, that we have right now. We need to realize that these natural resources, the powers and strength that we have, are, they're utterly inadequate for defense. They can't help us. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual. They're not carnal. And they're powerful to the pulling down strongholds. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is not our battle. So we have to, we have to take on spiritual weapons. We have to take on spiritual attitudes. And we have to go after things uh, from God's point of view. But if we... If, if, uh, we have this dross in us, this uh, uh, stuff that needs to be refined and pulled up out of us. We're going to have a problem when the, the battle comes. And the battle does not come on your schedule. The battle doesn't come when you're ready. The battle comes when the devil's ready. And if we're not ready for it, we're going to have a problem. It's not, a physical, it's not physical It's not. It's or carnal, but it's a moral battle that we're in. It's described in the, the word as the armor of righteousness, the armor of God, the armor of light, as opposed to fraud and cunning and iniquity of every kind. And we need to get the trash out of our hearts and out of our minds and out of our lives. You say, well, preacher, do I have to wait until somebody starts praising me to, to uh, get things taken care of? Absolutely not. And that's the whole point. We don't have to be put into the crucible. The Bible says, let a man examine himself. And so our job is to go and look at ourselves and, and look under a fine microscope at ourselves. And you say, well, I, I don't know how to do that. How can I do that? Oh, my, I'm glad you finally asked that. Uh, all we have to do truly is get alone with God and say, Lord, I want you to show me what there is in my life that's unpleasing to you. And don't quit asking until he shows you. So I'll ask that one time. We'll ask it again. And ask it again. And you keep asking until you're so tired of asking, you get frustrated. Say, God, would you just please, would you just deal with me and would you just show me what it is that's holding me back, the dross or whatever, the nastiness that I have in me that's going to keep me from being able to fight an effective spiritual battle to help me to win my children to the Lord, to help me to see them growing up right, to help me to heal my marriage, to, to live the Christian life. Would you show me what it is in my life? Would you just do it? And when you get serious with God, you say, okay, I think you're ready now. And he'll start working, and he'll start prodding, and he'll start probing, and he'll put his finger on something. And you'll say, oh, God, we don't want to talk about that. And he says, oh, no, we're not going to talk about it. We're just going to look at it. And then you get to decide, what are you going to do? You ask me what it is, and here's where we're going to start. God's so good. He doesn't show us everything that's wrong with us the day we get saved. He just takes us a little at a time. And he works on this, then he works on that. And once we get accomplished here, then he goes over to this thing. We work on that for a while and we work on this. And then we get those things beat. Then we go to another thing and another thing and another thing. And all along, it's here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. And we are growing in grace. We're going, growing in strength and in power and wisdom. And God is blessing us and our life is changing. And before we know it, we look more like Christ than we do like ourselves. We think more like Christ. And when the, 
the praise of man comes, we look at it and think, you're not going to get me with that trash. And we say, well, thank you very much, but God will be praised. It's, everything that's good about me comes from Him. And everything that's bad about me came with me when I was born, and I'm working on it. And we give the glory to God, and we just go on. The results of the warfare waged by the Christian through the use of spiritual armor for himself is security and honor. It's deserved honor to the cause that he's fighting for. It's victory. It's righteousness. And to his commander, it's great and growing renown. People look at you and say, man, he's got a real God. His God must be real. God is glorified. His kingdom is consolidated and is extended because we have given him the glory and the honor and allowed him to work on our lives. This thing of being put in the crucible, he said, that would be a horrible thing. It is if you've got the wrong attitude. If you've got the attitude that God is working in my life and I'm getting ready to be made better. I got to go to the doctor a while back, uh, the, not the doctor, actually the surgeon a few years ago, cardiac specialist guy. And I had some kind of problem. It was weird. I couldn't figure out what it was. But right across the very top of my shoulders here, all the way across the top, from shoulder to shoulder, right, just felt like just below the skin. If I was walking for very long, it hurt like the stinking devil. And I thought, what is that? And I'd be wiggling my head back, and I'd be hitting my shoulders. What is that? And then finally got to where I had to stop and uh, wait for it to go away. Then I'd go again. I went to, went to the doctor, and he did an uh, EKG on me. He said, oh, your heart's in good shape. Everything's in good shape. And and can't see anything wrong, and it just got worse and worse, and I kept calling my doctor, and they wouldn't call me back. And so I got fed up with it, and I called the Heart Institute, and I went over there. And I, they had a, a Dr. Hawk at H-Q-U-A-K-E-T-Z or something like that. From He's from India or somewhere. He's a Muslim. And I got to have a good time talking with him. And he asked me what was going on, and he said, we're not even going to do a stress test. He said, I'm going to schedule you for... Uh, uh, angioplasty or whatever. We're going we're gonna to go in and see what we can do here and find out what's going on. And so they went in and uh, they knocked me out, kind of. I was still kind of awake. And I sang the whole time I was there. And I just, I just sang, I just sang, and they'd get to laughing. And I, I can remember them laughing. I thought, what are they laughing at? And I just keep singing and singing. And, and he's running this, this thing up my arm and goes in somewhere and does something and just works around. He puts a couple stents in and found out I've got some blockages and stuff and, and come all out and boy, I'm good as gold now. I can walk and it doesn't bother me. And they complimented me on my singing. I think they were really proud of me or whatever. But anyhow, uh, they said, oh man, going in for surgery is a bad thing. No, that's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, now then my heart, you know, I got some blockages I'm going to have to deal with one of these days, but uh, I'm good. I'm golden right now. I can walk. I can do all sorts of things getting in the crucible allowing God to work on us is not a bad thing it's a good thing because when you come out you're able to do more than you could do before you went in you have a strength you have a power and you have a confidence that you did not have before the thing to do is allow God to have his will and say God I'm yours if you want to change me if you want to work on me if I need help have at it and when you go into the crucible, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You say, well, what's going to happen? Hard things will happen, but it'll be all right. Just keep singing. It'll be fine. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you that you love us so much. You come up with this tremendous idea of how you're going to deal with us. You'll put silver and gold in real fire. And you'll melt them down to nothing until all the, the nasty boils up and you're able to scrape it off the top of it. But with us, you put us in a different type of crucible, but it accomplishes the same thing. It brings the nasty out of us, and we're able to fix it. Well, God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd bless us in a mighty way and help us to allow you to have your will in our lives. Cleanse us, oh God, please. Bless us and cleanse us in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Now then, if our ushers will come, we'll take up our regular Wednesday evening tithes, offerings, and faith promise, and all those fun things.
It's almost November. I can't believe it. The year's almost gone. I didn't have nearly as much fun as I wanted to. I didn't get to build nearly as many things at the house as I wanted to. So let's pray that it doesn't snow or get cold the rest of the year. Wouldn't that be fun? Fun, huh? All right. All right. You're not buying into it, I can tell. Brother John, lead us in prayer, please. Father, thank you for the word that we've heard this evening. I thank you for the tithes we're about to receive. It's a blessing um, that we can use it to glorify and honor your name. Somebody have a blessing you want to share? We could sure use some blessings today. Anybody got something good going on? Your mother-in-law moved out or something? Yes. <laughs> Billy was able to leave her cousin who she's been praying for for years. Who was? Billy was able to leave her cousin to the Lord. Is, is that right? Well, praise the Lord. And then we were able to, I went out to check on her. We were at a birthday party and then her name was Yamada, and Yamada was just crying, and I got scared for a second, and I just got saved, and she's now worried about her mom and dad. Amen. She was crying because it scared her for her mom and dad. And there were some other little kids around the plane, and they came up and saw her crying too and wondering, and I just went ahead and told them why, and we were able to leave six kids to leave. <laughs> well, 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 isn't that fun? But you haven't had that kind of fun for a while. Oh, yeah. Amen. So I just want to thank God for the opportunity. And those kids range from 11 to 15. Huge Catholic background with their parents. That's fine. But they knew a lot. They were right. Catholics make great Christians once they convert. They really do. I gave them the testimony of Miguel. He's Catholic. Amen. <laughs> A perfect illustration right there. <laughs> That's a blessing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I need to hear that. Somebody else. Yes, sir. Well, my daughter came in from California. Surprise. And uh, she left the land of plenty to the land of Morgan Hunters. <laughs> she left the land of fruits and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to see you back. I thought maybe you brought the whole family. Now, you tell AJ, I appreciate his text the other day. That was a blessing. I don't even know if you knew he texted me. Yeah, he was, it was a blessing. Tell him I really appreciate it. Amen. Somebody else? All righty, let's stand. We'll be dismissed. God is very, very good. Hey, how is, uh, hmm, work the IMI with you? Eric. Eric. Uh, last week we talked. Saturday, he said he's doing good, just can't have visitors because he's in uh, his immune system is compromised right now. Yeah. So I, mean. I think I mentioned last week, once he gets past that, I'm going to try and get out there and see him. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Dismiss in prayer with Roxy. Father, uh, thank you for tonight. Thank you for church. And I pray, Lord, that we take the message now and use it to glorify you and to be able to reach others, Lord. And I thank you. Testimony tonight about people yet saved. Lord, I pray that we just have that in our hearts and help us to <clears throat> speak the word and to give people the good news that they need. Father, we love you. Thank you for your.